Welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. I'm Ted Bonnet. And I'm mostly Phil Proctor. I just got in from the East Coast late last night. And boy, are your arms tired. No, my soul has not caught up with my body yet. You know, the soul travels at the speed of a camel. And we were going, you know, 680 miles an hour or so. Didn't know that. Yeah, it's it's not here yet. Oh. It's clomping along somewhere in the Midwest. All right, well, let us know. I will. If it arrives during the show, you'll be the first to know. We have a great guest today who also happens to be a personal friend for many, 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 many years. And we'll talk about some of that. We've had many adventures together. Phyllis Katz. Yep. The the female counterpart of Phil is Phyllis. And there she is. Just as pretty as I am. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you, I think. <laughs> yes, nice. That's how something Trump would say. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, love, I love women. I, lo- and, I and, really love and women. And I'll make an exception for you. <laughs> You're not my type, but you but could you, be. But there are sharks who would like you. <laughs> yeah, right. Unless they're not hungry, in which case they may spit you out with your neighbor's cat. Hey, listen. I actually watched the rally he gave at Arnold Palmer's uh Golf club. Oh, yeah, the infamous. Speaking of the golf Arnold club. Arnold Palmer putts, putts and putter oh, my <laughs> rally. Oh, God. Do you, do you remember the big laugh that, um, was it, I think it was Jack Nicholas's wife was on the, on the yeah. Carson show many yeah. years ago. And he was on the bloopers record. Oh, you know, the, the gag. Yeah. Yeah. I what, don't know if we can say what, it. Yeah, I don't know if we can say it either. You can't say anything. And I don't know what it is, so no, how wonderful for okay. all of us. It had to do with... Uh, Johnny asked her, if good what luck. do you do to give give your good. husband good luck on the course? And she goes, well, before he plays, I kiss his balls. That's right. Carson, in his inimitable style, immediately says, well, that must make his putter stand up. <laughs> <laughs> and now, you know... It's everyday yeah. conversation in the political forum. That's right. I mean, it's... But not that clever. I think this is going to be uh, just a difficult birth of a new generation. And I think we're going to get through yep. it. I Manipulation so. is funny. It's all just a question of money. <laughs> There's the song. One of the reasons we're talking about this, I should say to our listeners, is that Phyllis has been with the Groundlings for... Since the Bronze Age, pretty much. Well, you helped pretty establish much. the right ground. I used, to dr- I used to ride a dinosaur at class, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then that didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, and the ground leaks is not known for its political comedy. No. Right? Is it? It's or- more social revelation. A and social and uh, it's character-based work. Some of it is just fun old stuff. But uh, there's plenty of social commentary and... Um, there's been some political stuff from time to time, but we were not known as uh, like um, the committee. Yes, Very political. Exactly. Right. That right. was what that was. I was watching the monologues last night, and it's simply not funny anymore. I mean, John Stewart did a great piece, but it just wasn't funny. It was mm. horrifying. Right. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's not. Um, uh, Comedy isn't pretty. Well, <laughs> <laughs> see, Martin said. <laughs> not only that, it's it's. Um, it's hard to satirize what's going on now mm-hmm. it because ever? it's so nuts to begin with. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, satirizing somebody losing his mind, there yeah. aren't a lot of laughs in that, you know? Yeah, yeah and, when, and, and when there's no bottom, I mean, that's his secret to his success thanks to Roy Cohen, which is deny everything and perpetuate the lie. Right. You create your new normals. Which I understand and if you have, is yeah. in the film The Apprentice, yeah. which is out now. Right, and if you have no... Moral compass whatsoever. If you are a malignant narcissist with a criminal record and you're facing sentencing next month, you'll say anything. Mm-hmm. And if you keep saying it, it becomes normalized. Is really and in a way, it defeats the opposition. Yes, but it, the problem isn't normalized. the guy. The problem is people who fall for that or yeah. people who are, you know, there are plenty well, of good just nor- people. They're just they're- normal people. <laughs> No, <laughs> they're they're people that no. have been that that unfortunately are supporting the pers- the person that is backed by the people that took everything off their plate, and in the outrage of what little middle class is left, and they feel they have nothing left, and they're angry, and they'd rather burn the place down. They're voting for the people that are doing it to them. Yes, and that's not new, though. I am not a, a statistician here, but um, there have been studies done that show that in general. We are more united in, in, in more things than we are divided, mm. and uh, people who want a certain kind of power divide us and to get mm-hmm. what they well, if want. You, so if you move the word united around, it spells untied. 
So yes. we are the untied states of America right now. It also it, spells din too, but that's not a real word. Oh, okay. I just, <laughs> well, we're also facing the world of, of uh, personal devices and social media, uh, absolute divisive techniques that have worked very well, fueled in large part by enemies, not, not yes. enemies within, not no. Putin. And I don't want to blame it entirely on him, but boy, oh boy, oh boy, did he know how to exploit our vulnerabilities. Right. And he has played the long game very effectively. But listen, the Soviets and the Russians have been masters of propaganda Mm -hmm. for centuries. And we've been slowly catching up and 40 years of brainwashing. Listen, when the Firesign Theater was doing its thing, we were in Procter & Bergman on KPFK Radio where you performed with us. You and My first time on radio. Your first time on the radio was on... Radio Free Oz, probably. Wow, right. what a what a John wonderful John Mayer, birth. Phil Hartman, Kip King, and me. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Wow. And boy, did we have fun. Edie McClurg was part of that mix, uh-huh. too, in those days. Uh, but, you know, 40 years of propaganda uh, has, has brainwashed uh, America really, really well. They, they did a great job of it, and uh, to, much to our detriment. And we, the Firesign Theater, was basically trying to deprogram people. With our records, we were trying to remo- we, we would make fun. We'd make a, a realistic sounding parody of a commercial, right. but then it would take you an entirely different place. Kind of a let's let's leave this behind and go and take care of ourselves, shall we? And and that was what hooked you in. People would hear it and go, oh, it's a commercial for wait a minute, personal liberty. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> you know, so yeah. that was that was our approach, and I, I I think a lot of comedy is liberating at its at its base. You know, just the fact that you can laugh about the Absolutely. stuff around you. But th- I think we've reached this point now where it's it seems to be dangerous to laugh about the things that are happening around us. The end of irony. Because how are you going to take the energy out of that? You know, when, when, when it's crazy to and begin the, with. And the parallels, um, Heather Cox Richardson, I don't mm-hmm. know if, if you read her. I do. But her column last night. I don't night, read anything by people with three names. Oh, well, you should because she wrote something yesterday, <laughs> last speed night. Reader. about speed reader. Ricky Lee Jones, great lyrics. you got to try it. <laughs> it was about how Hitler was elected. Because uh-huh. I used to ask my grandmother who grew up in Berlin and was there. And I would say to her, how in how hell did, did we, did, did people willingly elect Hitler? And she condensed it very quickly. She just said, well, you know, he promised a bad deal after World War I, and there was terrible unemployment. Yep. And he promised all the mothers jobs for their sons. He, she, he just yeah. didn't specify the job. <laughs> I think we right. just have to start getting truthful and, um, mm. and listening. Uh, here's where improv comes in. Okay. I think improv, not, not as theater, but as a um, way of communicating, should be taught in the schools. Or what at least a in a, or even after school program. Empathy. You look into each other's eyes. You have to make mm-hmm. eye contact. Mm-hmm. You have to listen. You have to listen and under, understand. You have to hear each other. Mm-hmm. Because I think people just want to be seen. They want to feel seen and heard. I hear that a lot from people. I feel like you see me or I feel like he doesn't see me. Mm-hmm. Something like that. And we all want to be seen and heard. And then I think we can have a conversation. And I don't mean before election day, obviously. Mm-hmm. But this idea that um, I'm not talking about Trump. That's a whole other thing because we're, we're in agreement about that. But right. I, I think that um, I, ha- I have some conservative friends and uh, we don't discuss this stuff anymore right. because we're not changing each other's minds. But when you get right down to it, for the most part, we want all the same things. And we would all mm-hmm. – and, and if you were driving your car with your dog and you were driving in, I don't know, let's say um, – Give me the most Republican state you can think of right now. Utah. Utah. You're driving in Utah. Your car breaks down. Somebody sees you on the road. Their impulse will be to help you. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're doing. There are a lot of fine people in Utah. There are fine fine people (laughs) on both sides. And there are maniacs on both sides. I spend a lot of time there, and there are a lot of wonderful Uh, people there. Utah has just been listed as one of the safest (coughs) states in the Union, Mm -hmm. along with Vermont and uh, Afghanistan. But getting back to your uh, <laughs> Afghanistan, where's where that, the Northwest? I'm just reading the oh, list. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> he meant Alhambra. He's, oh. His eyesight. He's, oh, yeah, you're right. It's an eyesight. I'm sorry. It is, my eyes are not very Getting back to the improvisational aspect of uh-huh. uh, Groundlings, that's your background. You teach it. 
You, mm -hmm. you helped found the Ground Lean School. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's interesting. You, you brought up that point about the value of, of interchange and communication, uh, particularly now. Uh, because uh, schools are uh, secondary schools, uh, universities are now, you know, liberal arts is so unpopular in so many ways. They're removing it, doesn't it from Yeah, because colleges. it's not making money. But some colleges are instituting it as uh, requirements even for STEM students because it's forcing them to create character and judgment and literature and decision making. Yes. And bringing back a conversation. And when you have a society that is divisive and undivided in their devices, improvisation is actually a really excellent tool to get people out of their shells, do improv just to learn how to communicate. Yes. I mean, I, I, it's interesting you mentioned the phones Corporate. because that's what made me think of this in the first place. My, um, my husband either read this or heard this on public radio a discussion about how um, many kids at schools were uh, in the cafeteria on their lunch break uh, on their phones and not talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember that as the loudest, most rowdy yeah. uh, cafeteria, yeah, 40 yeah. minutes of your day. <coughs> right, and right. Uh, <laughs> it, it depressed me. Yeah. And I thought, this is ridiculous. We've got to do something. And I started making notes to, to do this. I thought, we've we got to do this. Train teachers go fly to places and train the teachers so they can do this. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic hit. And ah. then everything got oh. worse. So I think some of what's going on, the any incivility also has to do with uh, uh, we all went through this thing together for yeah. for quite a while and then we're readjusting to it. I, yeah. I don't blame it for everything. I just think it's in the mix. But absolutely, I mean, I, I do corporate improv mm -hmm. teaching and sometimes uh, somebody will call and say um, – uh, we've we've got a group. We want improv. Sometimes, oh, it's our retreat. We just want to have fun. Uh -huh. Sometimes it's team building. Uh, sometimes it's we want one department to know how to talk to the other department. And, and oh, um, good. yeah, yeah. Good. And so you just design it based on that. But it's I've seen team leaders say, "Oh my God, I never saw them get that goofy. I yeah. never saw yeah. them get playful. Right. I never. I, I did one in Australia." And it Ooh. was, uh, I asked the, um, I guess he was the owner of the company. It was some financial firm, some financial firm. And I said to him, um, le let me know if they're introverted or extroverted. And he said, oh, they're numbers guys. They're, they're in introverted. Mm. They're not going to, they're going to do this, but they're nervous about it. Well, within five minutes, I saw that wasn't really the case. That may be what they're like at their desks. Right. But I would imagine when these guys go out after work, they have a really good time. Yeah. <laughs> and so once, I knew that from the warm up, And then, yeah. so... After it was over, um, the uh, man who hired me said, I've never seen them like this. I would never have known they could do this. And the thing is, of course they can. They're people. Yeah, right. We all played when we were kids. We didn't wonder how it was going. Yeah. We weren't being judged. You're just playing. Wouldn't That's that right. be interesting and to incorporate improv classes from, say, middle school through high school into college where it's basically forced social structure? The, the, the essence of improv is listening, isn't it? Well, yeah, and being saying, in the moment. It, and it's also saying yes, yes to everything, which is right. very interesting. The, the rules of improv. Well, I mean, there are a lot of guidelines. Uh, the one that seems to be um, universal, no matter what school you go to. If you're going to, if you're going to an improv school and it's any good, they're going to teach you some version of yes and, and uh, that doesn't mean uh, if you say to me on stage. Um, uh, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal all your money. I have to say yes, and I like that. No, you just have to agree to what the person set up. The premise. Mm -hmm. The premise. You're agreeing to the premise. But it gets you to get off your own idea, which is hard to do at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Get off your own idea if somebody else presented something first. You have to let that go and go with what's That's happening really in the moment. That's a good explanation of it. Wow. Thank and that, and so uh, reflective of how people are entrenched these days in their beliefs, their thoughts, mm -hmm. Their positions. You learn more about yourself after a while, yeah. And and you and and uh, how to relate to people. Um, I had somebody who took a musical improv class with me, and she signed up several times, several rounds. And she said to me at one point, 
I do this because it's cheaper than therapy and it works. Because <laughs> you get to express yourself and make it up and people are, people are applauding you for it. And, yeah. and uh, it, it's it, not to say that it's, it's a real easy thing in terms of doing it on stage. It takes, a, it takes a while. You have to learn it and get your reps in like anything else. But as a social thing, it's, yeah. it's in there already. It's been beaten out of you. I mean, it's you almost know? like party playing charades at parties and yeah, having you're, you're given permission to do silly things. And to... Right. In school, I can almost see like a physical education class. But that's what I mean. That's exactly what I mean. I, I've done some after-school programs, one with Peter Bergman. Radio Club. Oh, that I remember he that. Created. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. He, he created, created Radio Club, Club and uh, teachers. For schools. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. would go in. It was an after-school program, and we would – this was not improv. Yeah. But we – and the kids, they didn't know what radio was. Yeah. They thought of it as DJing. But mm-hmm. we would – you would write – they would – all together, you would write a radio play and perform it after several weeks. And, and it were, the average was sixth graders. Yeah. Fourth to sixth grade. I did it in fourth grade with when my daughter was in fourth grade, uh-huh. and we they I just came in as a parent, and we decided to do a Halloween uh-huh. uh, uh, audio piece, and uh-huh. had all the kids come up with ideas and then write them, and then um, and then I scripted it, and then they came over to our studio. And I had them all do wild line reads because they just weren't, you know, yeah. they were just starting out. And had every one of them do line reads. Aww. And then we edited it together. And those kids flipped. I yeah. Think, you know, I, I, I hope I didn't lead any astray down down a, a desired path <laughs> to get into for, radio. Yes, get into like radio. My dear late <laughs> or wife, die. <laughs> my dear late wife, Melinda Peterson, and I were also part of a program where kids – it was called the Something Neighborhood. I can't remember what it's called now, but kids would write That's their what, play, yeah. right? And then they, we performed them <laughs> as they wrote them in front of a live audience. That's Virginia Avenue Project. That's yeah. it. The because Virginia that Avenue was Project. in there. I, that was the next thing I was going to mention okay. because they were um, – This was in Santa Monica. Yes. yes. And it was uh, started by Lee Curran. That's right. It, it lasted for about 25 years and yeah. then she moved on. She's living somewhere else right now. Yeah. But um, – these kids, they were at-risk kids, and they were in a program that started, I believe, when they were seven years old. And there was some, it was um, teaching them about life through the arts. Mm-hmm. It was not about trying to make them mm-hmm. artists. Um, but they, at one level, they would write a play with a mentor. And at another level, they, they would... Um, uh, uh, they would perform. Sometimes they would perform, sometimes they would write. And Melinda, yeah. Phil's wife, and I did one together. We did a, um, right. it was a musical, and it was written by an eight year old. It was great. She <laughs> was a Ferrari, and I was a, a, a cheetah. Yeah, right. And the kid insisted that I was a male cheetah. And we had this, <laughs> and we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. We had so much fun. They had a woman who who wrote operatic music for it. It was <laughs> just great. And other times they would write something and you just come out and read it. Um, but they would always bring in actors. And I also was brought in to create a um, an improv program for, for them. Wonderful. So at a certain age, they did that. And then another time I did a, um, this was Lee's idea too. It was monologues. Uh, written and performed it was seniors and and teens mm. together and um it their success rate was remarkable a hundred percent of the kids i believe graduated high school um so in the 90 percentile range they went on to college and were the first some were the first yeah. in their family to do it wow. uh, one of them came back and worked in the Obama administration it was a, so learning these things how to work. learn how to think on your feet it was so funny when you say elderly my same grandmother I was telling you about she taught me comedy and improv I mean when she was in her grandmother 80, yeah yeah when she was probably in her 80s and I was still in my single digits mm-hmm. we would when I visited her did you think it was funny when she fell down <laughs> Oh, she played the perfect victim. We would go into a walk-in closet, and I was a subway driver, and she was a passenger who was very fearful of this bad subway driver. Oh, no. So the more I went out of control, the more she reacted. Oh, that's great. So she, totally, she totally encouraged me 
to yeah. pull stunts and <laughs> wow, do funnier funny. things. Wow. I think this is brilliant. I think we should have improv, more improv everywhere in our homes and our schools because I think it is a bomb to the to the isolation that that electronics has brought to oh, us. Oh boy, yeah, we've got to break. We should that. do that. Well, cool. this is really. It's not even about. Uh, a show business aspect. This is about relating to each yeah, other. Yeah, that's right. So a lot of these... It's a uh, social like for, idea. Yeah, for a, for a uh, corporate class, I'm not going to make them get up and do characters and perform and yeah. all that. Unless, unless they seem to want to be going in that direction, I'll go anywhere. But in general, it's it's start thinking out of the box, start yeah. uh, relating to each other. and um, Critical thinking. Yes. Our guest today is Phyllis Katz, a founding member and former director of the Groundlings Improv comedy group. Sometimes still. The Groundlings has been around a long time, like 50 You've years. You've got a permanent theater yeah, on Melrose. Yeah. How mm-hmm. many years? 30 years? Something like that? Um, let's see. I think it was 1976 we got the theater. Okay. Wow. And I joined in 74. They were around since 72. You came out of Second City originally, right? Yes. I wasn't in their main company. I was very briefly in their touring company, but yes, I trained at, Se- at Second City in Chicago. Some amazing people have come out of the Groundlings. It's, it's sort of a... Uh, birthing ground for a lot of fast wits yep. and who get discovered. I mean, was it the Groundlings where Lorraine Newman w- yes. was was stalked by um, <laughs> Lauren Michaels? She, uh, she was the first um, person to uh, get plucked out of there and into something great so that yeah. uh, when Sa- um, Saturday Night Live still started, uh, first started. We did a show with Lorraine. It's yeah. really wonderful. She's just the best. She's great. And, and she te- she's so honest about herself. Just terrific. If you go to sexyboomershow.com, take a listen to her show. It's also on your favorite podcast platform. You should be able to go back and find it as well. But Lorraine uh, told the story about how she was discovered at, at the right. Groundlings. That was such a fertile time for so many well, comedians. Phil Hartman is the other character that, that most was people later. are acquainted with. Yeah, later. yeah but there were so many. John well, Lovitz and, and Will Ferrell and Jennifer Coolidge and, 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 and yeah, people, who, people who had full careers as writers. And uh, I mean, I can't even list all the names and, um, uh, and people who you've never heard of who came through that Now, theater. you just had so a 50th brilliant. anniversary yeah. party. Yeah. What, last night? Saturday. Saturday night uh-huh. at the Jonathan Club downtown. Yeah, on the roof. Wow. How many people showed up? Around 300. That's like a high school reunion where people actually show up. Yeah, it was even um, it was even better than we could have imagined. It was just a night oh. of sheer joy and four hours of not thinking about everything that's tearing people up right oh. now. Good. Right? Oh, how nice. So it was just wonderful. Um, just a nice night celebrating um, uh, the the fun of this, making people what laugh, was that, writing. If you can go back to those early days, mm-hmm. um, what was what was the magic that made so many stars? I think part of it was that I viewed it as an artist community. We weren't uh, we, yes, mm-hmm. we were individually ambitious. We all wanted to be writers mm-hmm. and actors, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. and we were loving improv. But it was it was this environment where people were just discovering things, creating things, and discovering things through improv, and making each other laugh, and and teaching each other things. That the, what mm-hmm. what making we became each other of, laugh. That's so important. It is, and yeah. and I felt so lucky. I felt so special. I was with all these highly stimulating people. Yeah. And I had my day job. And then, <laughs> and then I'd come home and then I'd, I'd go to class. And it, would, it was just fantastic. And I mean, you had, you had uh, 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 comedy clubs. Uh-huh. And then you had improv clubs. And I guess a simple distinction would be one is a solo enterprise – doing stand-up, mm-hmm. and one was more of a collaborative where people who didn't yeah, consider themselves right. stand-up but wanted to interact and and perform in that manner because it was just easier for them or it was just came more Different. natural to them. We have people now in the school who also do stand-up. Yeah. I, mean, uh-huh. I think if you do uh-huh. if you do one thing, create, one creative thing, you do a lot of creative things. Yes. So, sure. so, so I mean... Well, you're very musical, for instance. You teach musical improv. Yes. 
And, and you have written three TV themes. Yes, and I only remember off the top of my head two of them. Wow. Uh, and one was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure they everybody... They all sound the same anyway. Yes, I, <laughs> you, I'm sure you all remember Women in Prison. Oh, sure. Uh, but oh. Uh, Ray Calcord was uh, the musical director at the Groundlings. So and my talented. very close buddy, and he's no longer with us, yeah. but Ray Calcord went on to score a lot of TV and film, and we did uh, a considerable amount of writing together. And... Uh, so we wrote the theme song to Scorch. We wrote the theme song to Women in Prison. And um, uh, and I can't remember. Oh, Almost Vegas. That was Tim Stack Ooh. on Showtime. Ah, right, right. Being cool. in love is almost Vegas. I remember that was the first line. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the mid-'70s when Saturday Night Live debuted, which was sourced out of these cl- out of these organizations, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it had happened before. I mean, you had Flip Wilson, you had Laughing, you had Carol Burnett, you had shows that did skit and sketches. Right. Well, and and you had shows. Mike Nichols and Elaine May started right. in a, right, and, a, right, and the, right. and the committee right. and, and Second City and committee, uh, Compass right. players. All those people that, did, but uh, the Compass players back yeah. east also. Yeah, but was it what was unique to that time that made the Groundlings different? Well, sometimes I think there's a gestalt going on because look at what Lauren Michaels was putting together in New York and what was happening in San Francisco with the committee. Mm. And Gary Austin, who started the Groundlings, uh, was, uh, had been in the committee. Bill Steinkellner and I had been in Second City. People were coming from different places. Mm. But mm. So I think what was happening um, was that some of us who... When I say we felt different, I don't mean I felt like I was alone in a corner and nobody wanted to talk to me. It wasn't that kind of different. But creatively, all of a sudden, I found myself in an environment that um, appreciated me mm-hmm. in a certain mm-hmm. way creatively. Because for everything else, it's like, well, you want an acting job, you're going to go audition. Yeah, you want a writing yeah, job, yeah. you have to write a spec script and yeah, submit it yeah, and all yeah. that. Here, it's like, hey, we're just having some fun and we're getting yeah, creative. Right. And, oh, my God, wouldn't this be a great sketch? And, oh, well, no, we were wrong about that. Hey, we're right about this one. I They're dying three, laughing. I have three words. Pee Wee Herman. Yeah. <laughs> Where else would you expect <clears throat> to see the birth? Of such a, an incredible, crazy... That and, came out of a class I taught. Oh, it did. Gary, you did. Gary Austin used to have these scene nights once a month. You'd sign up on a sheet. You'd just say what you wanted to do, oh, how, how long it was, wow, and who was in it. And he'd put a running order together because it was only for us. It was only in-house. Oh, I mean, boy. you could bring a friend, but we, no tickets sold, anything. And so we did crazy stuff. We did stuff we knew would never get in the show. We did stuff that uh, we hoped would get in. So I had my, a class I was teaching do a night at the comedy store very, very late at night. <laughs> and so everybody was doing a different comic or they were doing a, 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 somebody on the wait staff or somebody in the audience. And Paul yeah. said, I don't know what to do. And I said, I saw this Paul guy Rubens. at the comedy store and he, his humor was like grade school. He, he, it was, it's like the jokes you thought were funny when you were six years old. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then he would wait for a laugh. And Paul said, okay, I'll do that. So I didn't create Pee Wee. No he kidding. created Pee Wee. Wow. And then he came out and started throwing Tootsie Rolls out in the, the audience. <laughs> and then Gary Austin had an outside class and uh, um, separate from that. And Paul went over there and started developing this and working on it and wow. working on it. Um, so it's a workshop and sort of the grounds, improv, that kind of thing is almost like if there is an entry-level position to get into the business, if, you're, if you've got <laughs> talent – that's a place where you can walk in and work your way in. and, and It's a safe place to be. Yeah. You, well, I mean, it's a place where somebody can walk off the street if they have the talent yep. and work their way in, right? But, <clears throat> yes, and I think, but it's not, it's not as um, formulaic as that. You know, mm-hmm. and it's, it's uh, a lot of people say that if you have Groundlings, Second City, or UCB on your resume, mm-hmm. um, you're more likely to get called in or taken seriously or something because they know you have that that a uh, certain pedigree the, uh, the groundwork was like yeah, i don't yeah. mean if you were in the company yeah, i mean if yeah. you studied there yeah. okay and i i was helping um with a casting session for something that'll take too long to explain at cbs a few years ago and uh one of the casting um execs over there said to me uh i can always tell if somebody from who's reading for us is from the groundlings because they understand character. Mm. So that, that felt Some really good. Yeah. But to yeah. answer your question about what it was like, um, 
uh, in the beginning what was so special. It wasn't like, oh, we're going to get here and we're going to get picked there. I mean, you never know. Yeah. I mean, they're, like I said before, there are people you've never heard of who are so brilliant. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Some of them moved away again. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what was happening there was there was some kind of zeitgeist going on. And it was a very exciting thing to see live theater and things were happening on the spot. And then uh, uh, then all this that our generation had to say at the time as young people. And that's happening now. You've got a new generation. Yeah, tell us about your new show. Oh, okay. Periodically, I do fake benefits at the Groundlings. And in honor of the 50th, we're doing one uh, on Tuesday, the 29th, um, at the Groundlings. And it's the benefit... Uh, the benefit for train wreck Hoskins who pissed away his money and needs your help. And it's mostly improvised music and it's a train wreck is a record producer and composer. And we're going to look at his music over the last 50 years and try to raise money for him. Great cause. And that's Phil Lamar is going to be train wreck Hoskins. I don't know if you know Phil Phil Lamar. Lamar. And I have a wonderful cast. And uh, so we'll be doing that. But we do those periodically. We did the benefit for to buy Harper Sharfman higher SAT scores. Um, and I did another benefit to help Bitsy Petrowskis get some of her teeth fixed. You know, so we do the periodically. <laughs> so if somebody wants to see this. Um, Groundlings. Go to the Groundlings uh, website. website and look for benef- Ground- Groundlings.com? Yes. And I'll be there. Look yeah. for me. <laughs> and this is on Melrose in Hollywood. On Melrose, 7307 Melrose. Very comfortable theater, very friendly, very friendly. easy to get to. Yep. Great. And it's uh, Tuesday night, and if you look for benefit for train up Rec Hoskins. Question, when you brought up uh, Pee Wee, um, Andy Kaufman, did he co- go through? Was no. He, he never came But through? he was around. Yeah. The, I mean, not the Groundlings, but yeah. when you said some were stand-ups, we would, everybody would wind up at the Improver Cantors. Whether they were doing improv mm, right. or they were doing or they were doing stand up, we would all wind up at those places. So what was the name we, of that place? This the what room? The French room? The, the Viper room. Oh, oh, the Kibitz room. The Kibitz room. The Kibitz room. Uh, right. Cantor, it's the still Kibitz. there. Yeah, it's the still there. Room. Yeah, this sounded like a really wonderful dynamic social scene too. Within all of this, it was a lot of smart, funny people. I remember seeing sitting at the improv one night in the front where the bar is. You know, not not in the main room where the shows were going on. And sitting around a table, we'd all had class, and um, and I remember laughing so hard, and I had this <laughs> moment where I kind of pulled back, and I thought, we are all going to be so successful. <laughs> we are going to have such a great life. And I look now, I, I can go back to that, and I think of what happened and didn't happen and should have happened and could have happened. And, and, and it's like, oh, well, I'm glad I didn't bet the farm on any of that. You know, but, We're talking to Phyllis Katz, uh, a founder of the Ground Leans and the Ground Leans School of Improv. Teacher. This is yeah. Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. We're heard every Tuesday here on KPFK. And you can also hear our shows um, going back uh, many, many years now, Yeah, we've Phil. been doing this for three years um, or so, right? Uh, yeah, they're well over we, 60 shows. We've been doing this at the speed of a camel. That's right. (laughs) And you can find it all at SexyBoomerShow.com and also on your favorite podcast platforms. Is there a scene now like those days here in Hollywood, a a, a comedy (laughs) improv scene? I mean, in terms of a community and, and this kind of outrageousness that you had? Sure. I mean, I don't know what uh, feels like a newer form. But mm-hmm. we didn't invent the form. It had been going right. on since sure. the 60s, at, but, uh, or maybe even late 50s. Oh, I don't know. It went back to, to uh, Italian comedy, La Commedia. That was, those characters were all created out of improv with masks, right. remember? Right. All that stuff. Right. So it's, it's an ancient tradition. But I'm talking about the scene of doing this and turning well, of it course, to yeah. sketch. Temporarily, and, uh, yeah. I understand, of course. But sure, there's always something new. I mean, I'm around young people all the time, so it's like— Yeah, what are they bringing to the table? Um, they're they're bringing their perspective. Oh, you have the luxury of a perspective going back decades. Mm-hmm. Um, you've seen so much. Well, we all have seen so much change in this country. What do you observe in terms of what's different about the comedic mentality today? Well, there's there are more TV shows. There's more reality shows. There's YouTube. There's TikTok. Mm-hmm. There's social media, and so it's. People, I think, influencers. So it depends on, 
It depends on how serious people become about what they want to do, right? Do you want to be an artist? Do you just want to make a lot of money? What do you, you know? Yeah. Uh, so there's there are all different things going on, uh, but I do think that. Um, I think people are as enthusiastic as they've ever been. It's just that you have to uh, – well, I'm not saying this is what this generation is doing because I see a lot of them at the Groundlings. They're just, they, they just remind me of us right? Mm-hmm. when we okay. were younger. And, um, uh, but there, the difference here, as I can think of it now, is that we weren't well-known when we started. Mm-hmm. We were just trying to stay afloat. Now they get they come to the Groundlings Theater. You're a brand. Yeah, we're a brand, and I um, so I have mixed feelings about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to be a person. I want to be an artist. But but the Groundlings brand is certainly something I'm proud of. But it's it's not well, everything. And what they're doing is they're they're um, um, they're finding their voices with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So where it's going to take them, I don't know yet, but it's really fun when you see them take off. Ashley Padilla just got Saturday Night Live. She's oh. one of the newer members of the company. Wow. And um, she just got Saturday Night Live. Is she the one that went to Santa Monica High School? There's a, there's the new, one new cast member. Uh, probably. Yeah. Probably. Kind of a tall brunette. Well, she's got reddish hair. Yeah. Anyway, there, there's someone yeah. from Santa Monica High that's on the, on the cast. She's funny. I mean, yeah. it's, she's great. Yeah. I mean, she's she's. Great. I think it's such a testament to you, Phyllis. You've been doing this for so long, and yet, you know, you're just alive oh, and being, looking for the funny things in life. And God knows, there's a lot of uh, opportunity right now. Yeah. And what kind of drugs are you on? <laughs> <laughs> I am proud to say none. Yeah. Yay! Phyllis Katz, thank you so much for coming on our show. Thank you. you come and really, see her really show. Really Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show here every Tuesday on KPFK at 1 o'clock and at SexyBoomerShow.com. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks, thank Phyllis. Thank you, Phyllis. Thanks, Phil. Welcome home. We'll see you next thank week. Thank you. Oh, here comes the camel. Thank you.